Chapter 8 The old author lay on his bed by the side of the window, looking out across the almost deserted port of Montreal. Ships were not coming so frequently now. There had been so many strikes, thefts, and other unpleasant happenings that many shipping lines were bypassing the port of Montreal. The old author lay there watching very sparse river traffic, but watching very busy traffic on the road going over to man and his world, a place which he had no desire to visit. The sun was shining in, and the young girl cat, Miss Cleopatra, was resting with arms folded on his legs. She turned to face him, and grinning like the proverbial Cheshire cat, she said, "'Gov, why is it that humans will not believe that animals can talk?' Well, Clee, responded the author, humans have to have everything proved. They have to hold things in their hot little hands and pull it to pieces so that they can say, well, it might have worked once, but it certainly doesn't now. But you and I know that cats talk, so what does it matter what anyone else thinks? Miss Cleopatra turned the matter over in her mind for a little. Her ears twitched, and she delicately washed a paw. Gov, she said, why do you humans not realise that they are the ones who are dumb? All animals talk by telepathy. Why not humans? Well, the answer to that is rather difficult, and the author was rather reticent about giving it. But now look here, Clee, he replied. Humans are different in that they never take a thing on trust. You know there is telepathy, and I know there is telepathy. But if other people don't know it for some strange reason, then there is nothing that we can do to convince them. Now, is there? The author leaned back and smiled his love upon the little girl cat, his so constant companion. Miss Cleopatra looked straight at him and thought back, Oh, but there is a way, there is a way. You have just been reading about it. The author's eyebrows went up so high that he almost had some hair on the top of his head. After all, which was quite a change after so many years of being bald. But then he thought of a book he had been reading about some experiments. It seems that there were two researchers called R. Allen and Beatrice Gardner, and they were working at the University of Nevada. These two, a husband and wife team, were considering all the problems in teaching animals to speak and wondering why it was apparently impossible to teach animals to speak. The more they thought about it, the more puzzling it seemed to them. Of course, apparently they overlooked the most obvious reason, which is that animals do not have the necessary mechanism for speaking English or Spanish or French. Possibly they can grunt like some bad-tempered Germans do, but anyway, we're not dealing with Germans, bad-tempered or good. The gardeners, they are husband and wife, made a different approach to the problem. They realised that chimpanzees managed to convey meaning to each other, and so they studied chimpanzees for a time. They came to the conclusion that many chimpanzees converse by means of signs in a manner similar to that employed by those who are born deaf. These people secured a chimpanzee, and the animal was given the freedom of the house, and was treated much the same as a human would be treated, or perhaps possibly a little better, because many humans do not treat other humans too well, do they? But that is beside the point. These people treated their chimpanzee as a complete member of the family. It had toys, love, and one important thing extra. The humans in front of the chimpanzee conversed only by sign language. After many months, she was able to convey her meanings. Yes, it was a female chimpanzee, without particular difficulty. They taught this chimpanzee for some two years and she learned signs for hats, shoes, and all sorts of other articles of clothing, together with many, many other words. She was also able to convey when she wanted something sweet or when she wanted something to drink. The experiment seems to have been quite a success. It is not over yet by any means, but animals lack the necessary vocal cord equipment to speak in the manner of humans. Possibly they would have difficulty in passing and deciding on the correct tenses, but when humans are too stupid to be able to converse by telepathy, then no doubt the animal will have to converse by means of signs. It is a fact, a demonstrable fact, that Miss Cleopatra and Miss Tadalinka can make their wants and wishes known even to people who are not telepathic. 
With the author, of course, there was complete rapport, and author and Siamese cats are able to converse with possibly greater facility than between two non-telepathic humans. Miss Tadalinka sauntered in and said, You two talking about food? No, Tads, replied Cleopatra. We are talking about conversing with humans, and we think we are very fortunately having the gov tell our wants and save us the trouble of having to use sign language. Miss Cleo looked up at the author and said, You should be out, you know. You haven't been out for weeks. Why don't you get in your chair and go down into the grounds? It's a quiet day. There aren't many people about. The author looked out of the window. The sun was shining. There wasn't much wind. And then he looked at the typewriter and the blank sheets of paper. He muttered an appropriate imprecation about the paper and the typewriter and struggled off the bed and into the electrically propelled wheelchair. It is rather difficult getting along a corridor, getting out of a door and into an elevator when one needs hands to use an electric wheelchair, but it can be done. The author went down from the ninth floor to ground level. On ground level he decided to travel through the grounds and sit for a while by the side of the river. Along the concrete street he went and down the ramp at the end leading to the car park. Crossing the car park, he went up another little ramp to the sidewalk, a sidewalk which was quite, quite deserted. Gently he pushed the lever forward, and the chair moved ahead at walking speed. Suddenly there was a roar of a racing car engine, and a swoosh as a big car came on the wrong side of the road, and a harsh voice said, Stop! The author looked around in some surprise, and as he did so, a police sergeant and a police detective jumped out of a police car while the police driver was half hanging out of the driver's window. Oh, good gracious, thought the author, whatever is wrong now? The police sergeant and the detective hurried forward and stood in front of the now stationary wheelchair. The sergeant glowered down with his hands on his hips and demanded, You that author, fellow? Yes, was the reply. The sergeant looked at the detective, and the detective said abruptly, "'You should not be out alone. You look as if you're going to die at any minute.' The author was understandably somewhat surprised at such a remark, such a greeting, and he replied mildly, "'Die? We're all going to die sometime. I'm getting along all right. I'm on private grounds. I'm not upsetting anyone.' The police sergeant looked even more threatening as he replied angrily, I don't care how you're getting on. I say you're not going to drive alone. You're not safe to go out alone. They've told me up there, pointing to the building, that you were given just a short time to live. I don't want you dying on the road here when I'm on duty. The author was really astounded at such treatment and simply could not understand it. Admittedly, he was ill, otherwise he would not have been in the wheelchair, but to expect people to accompany him every time he went out. Well... That was bordering on the fantastic. There was housework to be done, all manner of things to be done, and the author wanted to be independent. He said, but I am on private property. The detective broke in this time, saying, we don't care if you're on private property or not. You look as if you are going to die at any moment. We are not thinking about you. We are thinking about other people. Now you get back there and I'll follow you. He seized the handles of the wheelchair, and with extreme roughness turned the thing round with such violence that the poor wretched author was almost tipped out. Then, with an angry shove, he commanded, Get going! Passers-by on the roadway leaned out of their cars, grinning at the sight of a man having trouble with the police. A man in a wheelchair? But of course, these were sightseers, and when people are out sightseeing, anything is a sensation. But it was always a source of astonishment to the author that whenever he was out in an electrically propelled chair, there was always a horde of grinning apes in big American cars hooting as if it was the funniest sight imaginable. He wondered what there was so amusing in seeing an old disabled man trying to live a life without being too much trouble to other people. But the chair was given another violent shake, and the harsh command get going, made him switch on the motor again and go back to the car park and up the ramp and on to the private street, the scowling detective following. At the entrance to the elevator, the detective stopped and said, Now, if you come out alone again, we shall take action against you. He started moving off to the police car which had followed, and as he did so, he muttered, 
silly old fellow, he's eighty if he's a day. So the old author got in the elevator again, went up to the ninth floor, and trundled the wheelchair back into his apartment. Another door had been closed. Now apparently it was forbidden to go out alone. It would have to be like a monkey on a chain or a dog on a lead or something. Miss Cleopatra came forward and, jumping on his lap, said, "'Silly unmentionables, these humans, aren't they?' But there was work to do, there was a book to write, and there were letters to answer, so the author mentally tossed up a coin to see which he should do first. The letters won. And the first letter on top of the bunch was from a young man in Brazil, a young man of rare good sense, a young man with very, very balanced questions. Here is the letter he wrote, and after it the letter which was a reply to him. Rio de Janeiro Dear Dr. T. Lobsang Rampa, I have already read all of your books, and I am very interested to study hard everything you told us, but, like every student has some questions, I'd like you to answer me the questions that I'll ask you. I'm sorry because I don't write and speak England well, as I'm still learning it in the school and many of the words I saw in the dictionary, so there are questions. Number one. If I die, I'll find many people who I've known. I'll see them like I saw them in the earth, but what is my real aspect whether I've already had many persons in my existence circle? Question mark. How a person who I had known in a before circle, would she see me? Question mark. Number two. Why just now an ancient tribe from Tibet, like you, came to tell us all of everything of the Oriental wisdom? Question mark. Why just now? Question mark. Number three. How could I see the Akashiko registry in the astral? Question mark. Number four. What is the better position to meditate? Question mark. I can't sit in the lotus position, and I can't sit with a spine erect. If you think some questions shouldn't be answered, don't answer them as I'll find them in the meditation. I hope so, as I've already found most of them just thinking myself. You are really a candle in the darkness, and I thank you for everything. Thanks very much, Dr. Ramper. Fabio Serra Dear Fabio Serra, Oh, lovely, you have sent me some questions which are worthy of answering in a book. I am now writing, and which will have the title of The Third Candle. As I propose to use your questions in this book, I am going to repeat your questions and then give the answer. So, here they are. Number one. If I die, I will find many people who I have known. I will see them like I saw them on the earth, but what is my real aspect, and do not just know how I look on the earth? Question mark. How would a person who knew me before recognize me? Question mark. Well, the answer to that is when you die, you first of all leave this earth, and you go into what many religions term purgatory. Purgatory is just a place where you purge away certain things. Suppose you had been out working in the garden and have possibly got some mud on your face or on your hair, if you have any hair, then you decide you want to come in and have dinner and perhaps listen to the radio. So, what do you do first of all? You visit purgatory. In other words, you visit a place where you can wash your hands, wash your face and, well, purge yourself of dirt or things which should not be on you. Many religions make fearful pictures of purgatory. I prefer to regard it as a celestial bathroom where you wash your astral, so to speak, so that you may appear in front of your fellows with your territorial integrity intact. You see, when you are in the astral, then you will be showing your aura, and if you have too many dirty marks on your aura, then it will show to those who look. Purgatory, then, is a place in the astral where you are greeted by your friends and never by your enemies, because when you get to the other side, you can only meet those with whom you are compatible. When you leave this earth, then obviously you think of yourself, you think of your appearance as you were on this earth, and that is how you manifest in the astral, precisely as you were on this earth. Because the people who meet you there want to be recognised, they also will appear to you just as you knew them on earth. Many times one has the same sensation on earth. 
You see a person, and you are sure that that person has a mole on the left side of the cheek. But another person might tell you, oh no, that mole was removed about a year ago. You only see, in other words, what you want to see, what you expect to see. So when you get to the other side, you will see the people you want to see, and you will see them in the form and colour that you expect to see them. A simple illustration. Suppose you had a negro friend, that is, the person was a negro on earth when you knew him, but supposing on the other side he was a white man, if he approached you, you wouldn't recognise him, would you? So he appears as a negro. As you progress upwards, then your appearance changes. In the same way you can have an illiterate savage, with hair all over the place and teeth stained with various berries, etc., but if you took that illiterate savage and scrubbed him several shades lighter and gave him a shave and a haircut and fixed him up in a modern civilised suit of clothes, he would look different, wouldn't he? Well, when you get to the other side and you progress, then you will find your appearance changing for the better. The second part of the question? Well, of course, this lady whom you ask about will see you when you get to the other side as you are imagining yourself to be. She will see you as you were on earth, and you will see her as she was on earth. Otherwise, to repeat myself, you would not recognise her. Number two. How did an ancient from Tibet like me come to tell Western people all about this sort of thing? Why should I come just at this time? That is a fair enough question, and I'll give you the answer. In the past there have been many people visiting eastern areas of the world, and people from the West are material-minded. They dwell in the present, they dwell amid thoughts of money, material possessions, power and domination over others. It is part of the Western culture. Now, when they go to the East and find that many of the finest minds of the East are housed in bodies which are sick or poor or clad in rags, they cannot understand it, and so they take the ancient teachings and, not having been born to the language, not having been born to the culture, they distort the ancient teachings to that which they, the Westerners, think should be meant. So it is that many translators, etc., do a definite disservice to humanity in propounding fallacious statements by distorting one's true religious beliefs. I was prepared for a very long time. I was given the ability to understand the West while still being of the East. I was given the ability to write and to get my points clearly over to a person who is worthy of knowing the answers. I have suffered more than any person should have to suffer, but that has given me a greater insight it has given me a greater range of expressions, of understandings, and has made me sympathetic to the Western outlook, and able to tailor my words to convey the true esoteric meaning to the Western reader. This is the age of Kali, the age of disruption, the age of change, when mankind truly stands at the crossroads deciding to evolve or devolve, deciding whether to go upwards or whether to sink down to the level of the chimpanzee. And in this, the age of Kali, I have come in an attempt to give some knowledge and perhaps to weigh a decision to Western men and women that it is best to study and climb upwards than to sit still and sink down into the slough of despond. In your third question, you ask how you can see the Akashic record when in the astral. To answer... When you enter the astral plane after having left this life, you will of course go to the Hall of Memories, and you will see everything that has happened to you, not just in the life you have just left, but in other lives that you lived before. Then you will decide, possibly with the assistance of counsellors, what you want to do to advance your evolution. You may decide that you too would like to help others coming from Earth. In that case, it is definitely to your advantage to see the Akashic record, so that you may help others more genuinely, that you will be given the power to see the Akashic record. But I must tell you that no one can see it just as a matter of curiosity. There are people nowadays in the West who advertise that for a fee they will travel into the astral, complete with briefcase, I suppose, and consult the Akashic record and come back with all the information desired. Well, of course, this is entirely untrue. They do not consult the Akashic record, and I doubt if they ever get into the astral consciously. The only spirits they consult are the ones that come in bottles. So, I repeat, 
you cannot see the accuracy record of another person unless there is some definite gain to be derived therefrom for the other person. Your fourth question is, once again, a very sensible question, one which I am pleased to answer because so many people ask it, so many people are troubled. Your question is, what is the best position to adopt for meditation? I cannot sit in the lotus position, I cannot sit with a spine erect. Question mark. Precisely. Let me tell you this. If you breathe, you do not have to adopt a special position, do you? If you want to read a newspaper or a book, you do not have to adopt a special position. If you want to read, you take a position which is comfortable for you. Perhaps you sit in an armchair, perhaps you lie down, it doesn't matter. The more comfortable you are, the more you enjoy, the more you can absorb that which you are getting to read. The same applies to meditation. Now, read this carefully. It does not matter in the slightest degree how you sit. Sit in any way you wish. Lie down if you prefer, and if you want to lie down in a curled position, then do so. The whole purpose of resting is so that you can be free from strain. You must be free from strain and distraction if you are going to meditate successfully. So, any position that suits you suits meditation. There it is. You've got your answers. I hope you'll find these answers of benefit to you. The old author leaned back with satisfaction of a job well done. What a tremendous amount of misconception and misunderstanding there is, he thought. Then he reached out and picked up another letter, this time all the way from Iran. One question in particular is applicable here, and that question is... What is the point of sleeping in the lotus posture? Question mark. Apart from mortifying the flesh, what good does it do? Question mark. This really is a most vexed subject. It really does not matter in the slightest degree whether one sits in the lotus position or lies flat on one's back. The only matter is that one shall be comfortable, because if one is not comfortable, then there will be all manner of strains and stresses which will distract one from rest and distract one from meditation. Let us look at this a bit closer, shall we? In the West, people sit on chairs. When they go to bed, they rest on a soft contraption, which has springs or some device which lets portions of the anatomy sag, so that if, to be unkind... One's behind sticks out a bit too much. The soft mattress or soft springs will permit one's behind to sink down in the mattress, and then the weight is more evenly distributed. The point is that in the Western world people have a system which suits them. It is their system, the system to which they are born, and if a Westerner wants to sit, he usually sits on some sort of platform supported on four legs and with a prop at the back to prevent him from tipping over. Almost from birth, then, he is conditioned to believe that he has to have his spine supported by something else, and so the muscles which normally would keep his spine erect become undeveloped or atrophied. The same conditions apply in the matter of legs, their joints, etc. The Westerner is conditioned to have his legs stick out at a certain angle and bend them down from the knees at a certain angle, and in any other position he is naturally uncomfortable. Now, let us consider the East, Japan first. In Japan, before entering a house, one discards one's footwear and then enters the house, walks into a room and sits on the floor. The only way you can sit comfortably on the floor is cross-legged, and one variation of that cross-legged position is called the lotus position. Throughout many years of development, the Japanese has found that if he grabs his ankles and nearly ties his legs in a knot, he is very comfortable. He is propped up on a good, solid foundation. Because he has been conditioned to it from birth, he finds no strain, no discomfort, no unpleasantness. He finds, too, that his spine is naturally erect. It just has to be because of that posture. Take a Japanese who has never seen Western appliances before and drop the poor wretch on a Western chair and he will be acutely uncomfortable. It will give him aches and pains in all the best places and as soon as he can decently do so he will slide off the chair and flop onto the floor in the accustomed position. 
if one takes a Westerner and puts him in a Japanese community so he has to sit on the floor cross-legged, he suffers agony. His joints have not been conditioned to that particular position, so, to start with, he thinks he's going to split, and then, when the time comes to get up, he usually finds he cannot. It is a delightful sight to see a fat old German who has been sitting cross-legged trying to get up. Usually he falls forward on his face and just saves himself with his hands. Then, with many a hearty groan, he gets his knees tucked under him somehow, and, with painful creaks and gasps and guttural exclamations, he gets to his feet, at the same time clutching his back and wearing upon his face the most anguished of expressions. In the Far East, sitting cross-legged is an ordinary matter of everyday existence. In the West, the culture developed of making money and of having material possessions, the Westerners think more of today, thinks more of having possessions upon this earth, and so whatever is a status symbol becomes desirable. In the days of long ago, kings and emperors and pharaohs and all that type of person sat on thrones, so the ordinary person got a few lumps of wood, knocked them into shape and used them as a miniature throne or chairs. Mrs. Smith wanted a better chair than Mrs. Brown, so she put some pretty cloth over it. But Mrs. Jones wanted something better. She was so bony that she was sitting on bones all the time, so she stuffed the cloth with wool, and then she had the first upholstered chair. In the Far East, people were not so money-conscious. They were not so possession-conscious. They tried instead to store up treasure in heaven or the local equivalent of that state, and people were quite content to sit on the ground. Thus, from birth, they have become accustomed to sitting on the ground. Their joints are more flexible, their muscles are designed for it. In India, the wise man sits under the trees in lotus position. He has to, poor fellow, he doesn't have a chair with him, and he's probably never even heard of a shooting stick. Westerners go along and see some old fellow sitting under a tree, and they think that that is a wise man, and so they confuse this posture with the acquisition of wisdom. Then you get some stupid fellow, perhaps he has seen a photograph of India or something, and he goes and writes a book all about yoga because he has heard a friend talk about it, or because he has seen something on TV. The author has no TV, he never did subscribe to the belief in the idiot box. Authors have done immeasurable harm to the real metaphysical teachings. Authors, without the actual knowledge of things, have copied the works of others and altered it at a bit so that they should not actually infringe a copyright. And then again, many authors resent what appears to be a newcomer who really does know his job from first-hand experience. So authors, the ones who copy without knowing what they are doing, must take the blame for putting a completely false interpretation upon the terms yoga, and similar. Many of these authors think they have to be clever and put Sri in front of their names. It is just the same as a fellow putting Mr. while living in an Eastern community. If these authors and poseurs knew anything about it, they would not be so utterly stupid as to copy terms which they do not at all understand. Many interpreters and translators have tried to take Far Eastern books and put them into English or French or German, but that is absolutely dangerous unless the translator has a remarkably sound knowledge of both languages and of the metaphysical concept. For example, many Eastern concepts are just that, concepts. They are abstract things that they cannot be translated into concrete terms unless a person has lived in both cultures. So we come back to the lotus position. The lotus position is just a seating position which an Indian or a Japanese or a Tibetan finds convenient and comfortable. He would not feel so comfortable in a chair, so he doesn't use a chair. In the same way, a Westerner cannot do so well in the lotus position because it is not a natural position for him. It is well known to circus people that if one is going to have good acrobats, then they must be trained actually from birth. The limbs must be trained to bend more than normal because the average Westerner has a very limited range of bone movements. The Easterner, it is usually said, is double-jointed. To be more exact, the Easterner has more training in bone movement. 
It is highly dangerous for a Westerner of perhaps middle age to try any of the exercises which are utterly commonplace to the Easterner. It is utterly dangerous for the Westerner to try sitting in the lotus position after joints, etc., have become stiff. The person who made that question all the way from Iran has another question about Ho Tai being a symbol of good living. Well, of course, the Ho Tai is just one example of a thousand Buddhas. In the Far East there are concepts instead of concrete terms. People do not worship idols. They do not worship a figure of the Buddha. The figures just act as a stimulus to certain lines of thought. For instance, a Ho Tai is a pleasant-looking old man with a fat tummy sitting in the lotus position. Now, that does not mean that you also have to sit in the lotus position. It just means that this pleasant old man with a fat tummy didn't have a chair, and if a chair had been provided he would not have used it, because a chair to him would have been uncomfortable. So he sat in the position most suitable for the training which his anatomy had had, cross-legged or lotus position. The whole tie, then, is just one of a group of figures, statues, pictures or representations of the different phases of mankind. You can say that reaching Buddhahood is available to all. It does not matter if you are king or a commoner. It does not matter your station in life. It does not matter if you are rich or if you are poor. You can be reaching for Buddhahood whatever your station in life. The only thing to go on is, how do you live? Do you live according to the middle way? Do you live according to the rule that you should do as you would have others do unto you? If so, then you are on the road to Buddhahood. This Buddha business is so often misunderstood, just as is yoga, yogin, lotus, etc. The Buddha was Gautama. Gautama was his name. Perhaps it would help a bit if one refers to Christian terms. Jesus was the man. Jesus was, in another conception, the Christ. One can be Christ-like, but you would not be Jesus-like, would you? In the same way, Buddha is a state, a rank, a status, the final result. That to which Gautama aspired and to which Gautama evolved, it is, in fact, a state of evolution, and all these different figures which many uninformed people call idols are not that at all. They are merely representations, merely reminders that it doesn't matter if you're an austere, the serene Buddha, or a jovial person, the Ho Tai, one can still attain to Buddhahood provided that one does live according to the true belief which is the middle way, the do to others as you would have them do to you. The old author leaned back exhausted with the effort of doing work. His health had been getting steadily worse as witnessed the incident with the police, when yet one further door to freedom on earth had been closed, and now he was tired of writing. For a time he switched on the good old Eddystone shortwave receiver, and listened to the news around the world, from India, from China, from Japan, and from Russia. It seemed that everyone in the world was saying unkind things about everyone else. Ah, he said to Miss Cleopatra, at least we do not have television to look at all the horrors of the Western gun-shooting scenes and all that rot. I don't know why we can't have good news information on the television instead of sex, sadism, and assorted sin. Miss Cleopatra looked wise. She looked down and then delicately started to clean herself again, although she was cleaner than almost any human would be. Gov, she said rather diffidently, Gov, haven't you forgotten something? The old author started and went into a considerable confusion of cogitation, wondering what it was that he had forgotten. Why was Miss Cleopatra being so diffident? Well, no, he said at last. No, I don't think I have forgotten anything. But if you think I have, well, just tell me, and I'll see what we can do about it. Miss Cleopatra stood up and walked the length of the author, and then sat down on his chest in her favourite position, so that she could whisper in his ear. Gov, she said, you said earlier in this chapter about animals talking, you said about the chimpanzees, but you told me before that one should never, never quote from anybody else's book without giving the complete title and author. Didn't you forget that? The poor wretched author almost blushed, except that blushing was a virtue quite beyond him. Then he bowed to the little cat and said, 
Yes, Cleo, you are perfectly correct. I will rectify my omission now. Reference was made to the husband and wife team of researchers by the name of Gardner, who taught a chimpanzee sign language. The information was obtained from pages 170 and 171 of the book entitled Body Language by Julius Fast, published by M. Evans & Co. Incorporated, New York. Miss Cleo slowly rose to her feet, yawned, turned about, and gently flicked the top of her tail as she walked down the length of the author again and lay across his ankles. Obviously, she was highly satisfied that she had played her part in seeing that acknowledgement was given where acknowledgement was due. Having played her part, she curled up comfortably and went to sleep. Every so often her whiskers flicked and twitched with the pleasantness of her pure and innocent dreams.